Well, hello again, and welcome back to the Straight A Nursing Podcast. I'm Nurse Mo, and as always, I'm so happy that you are taking time from what I know is a really busy schedule to hang out with me for a little bit. So in this episode, we're heading over into maternal newborn land and talking about polyhydramnios. We talked about oligohydramnios a few weeks back, and if you want to check that episode out, pop on over to episode 220 for that. First, I want to say hi to my friend Carrie for this listener shout out. So Carrie says, this podcast and Nurse Mo are wonderful. I start nursing school in January and this podcast is really helping me prepare. I'm very excited and nervous, but Nurse Mo is helping me feel ready to take on this challenge. I also have Nurse Mo's planner and it is wonderful. I will definitely be ordering another one when I finish this one. Thank you for all you do. Carrie, I want to say thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to write that review and give me your feedback. I love hearing from students. And again, thank you, Carrie, so very much. So if you want to leave feedback on the podcast, then I have got instructions and episode notes for a super easy way to do that. Okay, are we ready to talk about polyhydramnios? Polyhydramnios is a condition in which there is too much amniotic fluid produced during pregnancy. So a few weeks back, again, we talked about oligohydramnios, which was not enough amniotic fluid. So this is the opposite. So initially, amniotic fluid originates from maternal blood that diffuses across the placenta. And this fluid is later swallowed by the developing fetus, and the volume of the amniotic fluid increases as the fetus urinates. Amniotic fluid acts as a very important cushion for the fetus and also provides temperature regulation. It also aids in lung and kidney development. As the fetus gets closer to term, it will produce between 500 and 1200 mils of urine each day and can swallow between 210 to 760 mils of amniotic fluid each day. Any disruption in this delicate balance can drastically increase the amount of amniotic fluid in the womb. So let's look at some possible causes for polyhydramnios. One is uncontrolled maternal diabetes or gestational diabetes. The elevated blood glucose levels lead to polyuria in the fetus, and this increases the amount of amniotic fluid. There's also esophageal atresia or duodenal atresia in the fetus. In these conditions, the fetus is not able to swallow the fluid, which leads to higher levels of amniotic fluid in the womb. Also, pregnancy with multiples, such as twins, and rhesus disease. In rhesus disease, the developing fetus's blood cells are attacked by the mother's immune system. Also, lithium and maternal substance abuse can lead to polyhydramnios, as can infections, and those are going to be parvovirus, toxoplasmosis, rubella, and cytomegalovirus. And it can also be unknown what the cause is. When the polyhydramnios is mild, many times, we don't know why it's happened. In general, some things that would put someone at higher risk for polyhydramnios are going to be maternal diabetes, advanced paternal age, so advanced age of the male, fertility treatments, and incompatible blood types between mother and baby. So what are the complications of polyhydramnios? So the effects of it are going to be pretty dependent on how severe it is, how much excess fluid is present. Now, maternal complications include umbilical cord prolapse, premature rupture of membranes, preterm labor, amniotic fluid embolism, and placental abruption. We can also have postpartum hemorrhage occur to the overstretched uterus, not contracting adequately after birth. There's also a higher incidence of cesarean delivery due to abnormal fetal presentation, specifically a transverse position. 
Now, fetal complications are varied and can include neural tube defects, GI obstructions, achondroplasia, cleft lip, cleft palate, and fetal hydrops, which is an abnormal fluid accumulation in the fetus. So you got a little bit of an understanding of polyhydramnios now. How about we dive into it, how we care for these patients using the straight A nursing latte method. So we'll start with the letter L. How does the patient look? What are the signs and symptoms? What are we going to notice about this individual? So the mother may complain of shortness of breath due to increased pressure on the uterus, which is going to limit lung expansion. There may be edema of the lower extremities and unexplained weight gain, which is due to this excess fluid. The uterus will be larger than expected size, and generally there's like a rapid increase in the size. Preterm contractions can happen. The individual may have hemorrhoids and constipation due to pressure being placed on the GI tract. They could also have varicose veins on the lower extremities. With maternal diabetes, the mother will display those classic symptoms, which are polyphagia, polydipsia, and polyuria. The mother could have intense sudden pain and dark red blood if placental abruption occurs. If you want to learn more about placental abruption, then head on over to episode 92. Another thing that may be noticed is abnormal fetal heart rate due to cord prolapse, which is going to cause moderate to severe variable decelerations. So the next letter in the latte method is an A. How do we assess the individual with polyhydramnios or for whom we suspect polyhydramnios? So one thing we can do is measure fundal height. It will be greater than expected for gestational age. We also want to get a full set of vital signs paying special attention to blood pressure, which may be elevated. Weigh the patient, making note of any unexpected weight gain. And you'll also assess for edema, shortness of breath, constipation, and other factors associated with increased pressure on internal organs. You can also use Leopold maneuvers to determine the fetal presentation. Remember that the extra fluid is basically giving the little guy in there more room to swim around. They could end up in a transverse position, sideline position, or other non-optimal birthing position. You also want to listen for the fetal heartbeat. Diminished sounds could indicate increased amniotic fluid is present. So what about the test? That's the next letter in the latte method. Many of the tests for polyhydramnios are going to be similar to the ones we talked about for oligohydramnios. The gold standard diagnostic test is ultrasound measuring the amount of amniotic fluid. It's important to note that the sonographer's experience plays a key role in the accuracy of these measurements. So a couple of different ways we can do this. We can do a single deepest pocket measurement or the AFI amniotic fluid index. So with the single deepest pocket measurement, the uterus is divided into four quadrants and the amniotic fluid volume is measured in each quadrant. A measurement of over 8 centimeters in any single area is indicative of polyhydramnios. So 8 to 11 centimeters is considered mild polyhydramnios. 12 to 15 is moderate and 16 or more is considered severe. This is the simplest and most commonly used measurement technique. Now the AFI or amniotic fluid index is done in this way. The practitioner measures the largest amniotic pocket in each of the four quadrants and then adds them together to get this AFI number. So mild polyhydramnios is an AFI of 25 to 30 centimeters, moderate is 30.1 to 35 centimeters, and then severe is an AFI greater than 35.1 centimeters. Ultrasound is also utilized to evaluate the fetus for conditions that can lead to polyhydramnios, such as esophageal atresia. Other tests include a biophysical profile, or BPP. 
This is a type of ultrasound that assesses fetal breathing. It assesses amniotic fluid volume. It assesses fetal tone by looking at episodes of extension and flexion and fetal body movement. So that's the biophysical profile. A non-stress test involves the mother wearing a monitor to assess fetal heart rate while at rest for about 20 to 30 minutes, maybe longer if there's been a trauma, if they're bleeding, or has had decreased fetal movement. Basically, we are going to be monitoring that heart rate while mom's at rest, non-stress. A gestational diabetes test, also known as a glucose tolerance test, is going to assess for gestational diabetes. Something called TORCH serology, T-O-R-C-H, is going to test for those culprit infections I mentioned earlier. A nitrazine paper test can identify amniotic fluid when membrane rupture is suspected. So if there's fluid, you can do a nitrazine paper test and tell if that's, you know, is it urine? Is it amniotic fluid? That will tell you quickly. Amniocentesis may be conducted. This procedure is done to test for any genetic conditions that can cause polyhydramnios. And amniocentesis can also provide valuable information about fetal lung maturity as preterm labor is common with this condition. If fetal anemia or fetal hydrops are suspected, tests will be conducted to rule out hematologic and immunologic disorders. Okay, now how about treatment? How are we going to treat this individual? That is the next T in the latte method. One treatment is amnio reduction. In this procedure, excess amniotic fluid is simply removed. Note that this will need to be done repeatedly as the fluid will continue to build up. During the procedure, Tocolytics will likely be used to prevent preterm labor from occurring. Other risks with this procedure are placental abruption, premature rupture of membranes, and infection. In severe emergent cases, a cesarean section may be needed for immediate removal of the baby from the womb. Fiber supplements may be utilized to prevent straining during bowel movements as that can increase pressure on the uterus, causing premature rupture of membranes. You want to position the mother for optimal blood return to reduce pressure on the cervix and lower extremities. This can be as simple as elevating the legs, but may require total bed rest in some cases. And then in cases of diabetes, they're going to be following a carb-controlled diet. They may be exercising if they're not on bed rest and may even need insulin. Pharmacologic treatments include prostaglandin synthetase inhibitors such as indomethacin and sulindac. These can decrease the amount of urine that the baby produces. Most cases of polyhydramnios respond to this treatment in about a week, provided the cause is not related to a fetal swallowing disorder or hydrocephalus. Tocolytic drugs may be used to stop contractions in preterm labor, and steroids will help a preterm baby's lungs more rapidly mature if delivery is imminent. And then the final component in the straight nursing latte method is E for education. What are the key teachings? The most important things you can teach your patient are when they need to call their doctor as serious complications can occur. Make sure they understand the signs and symptoms of preterm labor, premature rupture of membranes, placental abruption, umbilical cord protrusion, and any other complication they are at risk for. Other key teachings include diabetes teaching. If the cause of the polyhydramnios is due to diabetes, you will provide extensive education on dietary guidelines, blood sugar testing, and proper medication administration. You also will teach what to expect during various procedures. For example, the mother should know to empty her bladder before an amniocentesis or to have a snack prior to a non-stress test as the baby is likely to be most active after eating. You want to ensure everyone understands the indications, the proper administration, and side effects of any medications. Indomethacin and Sulindac should be taken with food to decrease GI upset 
and they can increase the hypoglycemic effects of insulin and oral anti-diabetic medications. So they may need to monitor their blood sugar more closely and speak to their physician about changing their dose if that is what's needed. Substance abuse is definitely an area of education. You want to educate the mother on the importance of abstaining from drug use and provide resources as necessary. In the clinical setting, this usually includes a social worker consult. And if a baby is known to have an abnormality, the family will need extensive education regarding care and possible treatment options. So there you have it. There is your quick overview of polyhydramnios. I hope that you come back and join me next week. I'm diving into a pretty big topic. We're going to be discussing different types of anemias. So I will see you back here for that. Bye for now. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing. 